Hello, I'm Dave, and this is a video transcription of a talk I gave recently called the Human Body Workshop, and it covers what I call the body-centric approach to healing. The current paradigm for healing the human body is medicine and medical treatment, but it's a particular type of medical treatment called allopathic medicine. Now this approach is concerned with treating only the symptoms of an illness and not the illness itself. Now this approach is rather like taking your car to a garage because the engine warning light has come on and the mechanic takes the bulb out. The warning light is the symptom and by taking the bulb out, well, the symptom is treated but the problem still remains and it's only a matter of time before that problem manifests in some more catastrophic manner. The allopathic system has its basis in the theory of evolution, and since, according to this theory, the process of evolution is continuous and ongoing, well, that implies that the human body is not fully evolved, and therefore is imperfect and susceptible to disease and mechanical breakdowns. It also suggests that the only way, the only valid way to remedy these problems is to introduce poisonous pharmaceutical chemicals to the body, slice into it with very sharp knives and hack out the offending organ, or replace it with a toy version of it made out of plastic or titanium, and to recuperate in expensive hospital facilities with tightly controlled environments that are almost always toxic. I mean, when was the last time that you had Legionnaire's disease or a flesh-eating virus in your home? So, the allopathic system treats the human body as if it were a faulty machine made up of separate replaceable modules. The heart unit not working properly? Well, whip it out and fit a new or second-hand one in. Got a cough? Well, let's ignore the fact that the cough is the body's emergency attempt to purge the lungs of toxic air, and let's suppress the coughing mechanism so that you can continue to breathe it in comfort. Without exception, all allopathic treatments and procedures come with what are termed side effects that cause further symptoms, usually unrelated to the original ones. Now these are not inadvertent secondary effects that arise out of an attempt to heal the body. Rather, they are intentional primary effects that implement a fiendish business model. The pharmaceutical corporations now produce food that cause various symptoms, for which that same corporation provides a symptom-suppressing drug. That drug causes further unrelated symptoms, which require more drugs, and before long, the patient is on a whole raft of drugs each to counteract the effects of the others, and the corporation has another lifelong customer. Not surprisingly, this is a trillion dollar industry. Don't take it personally, it's just business. The body-centric view is very different. It considers that the human body is perfect, whole and complete. It internally manufactures everything that it could ever require and left to its own devices, it will repair and maintain itself in the best state of physical health it can manage in the environment and circumstances it finds itself in. In fact, despite what the medical system might have led you to believe, the human body is the only thing that can heal the human body. Not drugs, not surgery, not herbs, nor pink Himalayan sea salt, or mysterious energies. It's always the human body itself that does the healing. Does it seem logical to you that a body that was designed to live anywhere on Earth should be dependent for its survival on a type of salt found on the slopes of Mount Everest, or leaves of the moringa plant that only grows in the African jungle? How does that help you if you live in Basildon and access to African flora and Himalayan mountain ranges is minimal? Body-centric health is all about not interfering with or hindering the healing process, but understanding the body and assisting it to do what it's trying to do. This approach is simple, costs nothing, and has no side effects except increased energy and vitality, general improvement in overall health, 
and looking and feeling younger, fitter and stronger. Because we treat the whole body as a conscious, intelligent community working together in perfect harmony rather than a collection of 40 parts that work independent of each other. So in order to do that, we need to accept that the current interpretation of how our bodies work, while reasonable sounding, is nonetheless incorrect. We need to better understand how our bodies cleanse and heal, how it allocates and uses energy, and we also need to understand the connection between the mind and body. The body-centric perspective is about understanding that symptoms are not the actual problem, but are warning messages from the body. We need to be able to correctly interpret them, respond appropriately, and apply changes to our minds to prevent the problem from reoccurring. So, why is it so important to change our view of how our bodies work? Nothing about the current medical system came about by accident. The allopathic method of treatment did not reach its position of preeminence because its healing methods or success rate are superior to other forms, but because it was engineered into place by massive amounts of money from the same group of people who have publicly stated time and time again that their agenda is to reduce the human population by 90%, which is a euphemistic way of saying, we want to kill 6.5 billion people. In the third world, this is being accomplished through war, famine and disease, by creating and arming and controlling both sides of a manufactured conflict, by using its political influence and corporations to take over the growing of food, pricing it out of the range of the locals and to ship it out of the country, and by using these countries as a testing ground for their bioweapons programs. AIDS, Ebola and sickle cell anemia are all biological weapons manufactured in weapons labs in the United States. In the developed nations, the genocide is being accomplished using healthcare, iatrogenic deaths, that's death by doctor, vaccines, pharmacology, sterilizations and care pathways. The Liverpool Care Pathway is the best known program in the UK and while it sounds all nice and fluffy, what it really means is, if nobody is looking or cares about a patient in long-term care, they will trank them up on morphine and starve and dehydrate them until they die. Healthcare is a weapon that is being used to exterminate us slowly, quietly, yet relentlessly. Every day, 290 people are killed by FDA-approved prescription drugs. And that's the conservative number published by the Journal of the American Medical Association. The source of this information? JAMA, Volume 284, Number 4, July 26, 2000. Authored by Dr. Barbara Starfield, MD, of the John Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. That study, which is 12 years old, and drug deaths have risen considerably since then, documents 106,000 deaths per year from the adverse effects of FDA-approved prescription medications. To reach this number from outbreaks of violent shootings, you'd have to see an Aurora, Colorado Batman movie massacre take place every hour of every day, 365 days a year. If a massacre of people using slugs of lead is bad, why is a massacre of people using deadly chemicals perfectly acceptable. No one in Washington talks about prescription drug deaths. There are no sobbing victims shown on the evening news. This chemical massacre happens quietly, behind closed doors. Yet to achieve this level of mass death in the world of plane crashes, for example, you'd have to see a jumbo jet airliner crashing into the ground every day of the year. But that's only the beginning of the mass death caused by modern medicine, where greed-driven doctors are routinely bribed by the drug giants, and thereby make the joker James Holmes look like a Boy Scout in comparison. As Natural News has revealed, just one company, GlaxoSmithKline, had a bribery network of 49,000 doctors 
who receive financial kickbacks to prescribe more Glaxo pharmaceuticals to more patients. The company admitted to bribing doctors and paid a $3 billion settlement to the federal government in 2012. According to the report Death by Medicine by doctors Gary Knoll, Carolyn Dean, Martin Feldman, Deborah Razio, and Dorothy Smith, the medical establishment kills 783,936 people in the United States every year. Those deaths include 106,000 Americans killed from drug side effects, 115,000 Americans killed from bed sores, 98,000 Americans killed from medical error, 88,000 Americans killed from infections, 32,000 Americans killed from surgery, 37,000 Americans killed by unnecessary medical procedures, and much more. See naturalnews.com for links to the original data. The bottom line total comes to 783,936 deaths every year from conventional medicine, that's drugs and surgery medicine. It means you are 6,200% more likely to be killed by your doctor than by a homicidal shooter. According to the CDC's numbers from 2007, the total number of homicide shooting deaths in the United States each year is about 12,600. This is from Death's final data for 2007 National Vital Statistics Report at the Centers for Disease Control. This means that your risk of being killed by your doctor is 62 times higher than the risk of being killed by a homicidal shooter. Put another way, that's a 6,200% higher risk. It seems that before we even think about the issue of gun control, we need a national debate on doctor control. After all, when doctors inadvertently kill people by prescribing deadly chemotherapy cocktails or deadly prescription drugs, they don't even get arrested for it. But they do get financial kickbacks, exotic vacations paid by the drug companies, free travel, free meals, and other perks of being a big pharma sellout. Plus, they're free to go on killing other people over and over again. While doctors obviously don't intend to kill people, they nonetheless keep doing so, as long as they get their bribes, kickbacks, and perks. If politicians really wanted to protect Americans from being killed, they'd call for restrictions on the prescribing of deadly pharmaceuticals. More important than gun control, what we really need now is doctor control, or big pharma control. The elite see this as a war on those that it considers weak, stupid, undesirable or unfit to survive. If you succumb to their poisons, then you are weak. If you can't work out what is happening to you, then you are stupid. If your skin is the wrong colour, then you are undesirable. And if you are not part of their gang, you are unfit. In this day and age, survival is the best form of resistance. And your best chance of survival is to turn away from the medical system that genocidal criminals have provided you with and take back responsibility for your own health. So let's start with the food that we eat. If you get your groceries from a place like this, then it's not food that you're eating. I would say that 98 to 99% of what you find in these places is not actually food, but synthetic chemicals or chemical and textural extracts processed and artificially flavoured and coloured to look like food. The rotting meat in the delicatessen section is bathed in carcinogenic sodium nitrate and potassium nitrate to preserve it, and treated with poisonous carbon monoxide to keep it red and fresh looking. Food is not our friend. The first myth that we need to dispel is that food goes inside our bodies and somehow becomes part of us. It doesn't. Food doesn't go inside us. I know, I know. We eat an apple and the apple goes inside us. But it really doesn't. Consider the donut. Everywhere you look on the donut, you're looking at the outside of it. Even when you look down the hole in the middle, it's still the outside of the donut. Imagine stretching out that donut 
into a long tube. Even if you look down into the hole, you're still looking at the outside of the donut. Put a set of teeth on one end and a bottom hole at the other, then you have us. Food doesn't go inside us, it goes through us. Our intestinal lining is made up of modified skin cells and our stomach is just a bulge and tube. If you were to carefully measure what you eat and what comes out of you, you'll find that 99% of what you put in comes directly out again. A very tiny proportion is absorbed into the body, but it too is ejected after performing a stimulatory action. And this is what food actually does. It provides a type of stimulation that the body reacts to. Imagine if you were walking through a forest and you accidentally brush against some stinging nettles. A chemical reaction occurs on the skin's surface, but inside the body, all sorts of processes are stimulated into action. Increased blood flow to the area, white blood cells are produced. There's a histamine response, culminating in a painful, itchy welt under the skin. The stinging nettles didn't penetrate the skin or become part of it. It merely stimulated an internal reaction. When you eat, the chemical content of the food contacts the modified exterior skin cells and stimulates an internal reaction. And that reaction is provoked because the food is toxic to some degree and the body responds in order to protect itself from it. Another common misconception is that food provides the body with energy. It doesn't. In fact, the opposite is true. Food drains the body of energy while providing none. Not only does it take energy to raise a response to the stimulation that food provides, but it takes up to 80% of the body's energy to digest or get rid of the food. I mean, how do you feel after having a big meal? Do you feel energized and bursting with energy? Or do you feel tired, lazy and lethargic? Most people feel the need to eat three square meals a day, which means they're running on 20% of their energy all day, which is barely enough to keep you walking around. And it's partly why we find it so difficult to recover from illness and injury. We simply don't have the energy. And as I said earlier, most of what we call food isn't actually food. See if you can guess what this man is making here. Yep, it's artificial lettuce from chemicals. And I'd bet that they are symptom creating chemicals at that. There is an amazing book called Man's Higher Consciousness by Hilton Hotema, and in it Hotema claims that man was originally, and still is, a breatharian. That is, somebody who neither needs to eat or drink. But over the ages we fell through various stages, and at each stage our vitality and lifespans reduced. So we started drinking water, and our bodies had to adapt to this new habit moving away from its perfect equilibrium. Then we started eating fruit, and our bodies had to adjust still further to deal with this solid matter. And so our vitality diminished, and we became more susceptible to disease, and our lifespans reduced further. Then we ate the vegetation, and eventually the flesh of animals, so that our bodies are now in a pitiful state compared to the original, and with woefully short lifespans of around a hundred years if you're lucky. If you take the lifespans detailed in the Bible as true, well, Methuselah lived for nearly a thousand years, so in comparison, we die in childhood. But unfortunately, we have fallen through even more stages than even Hotema could have envisaged. Burnt omnivore, 
reflects the fact that we alone, of all life on this earth, feel the need to burn our food before eating it. And the act of cooking food causes the creation of a carcinogenic substance called acrylamide, which causes the body to respond as if it had been poisoned. The final stage I've added is GM chemovore, which represents the fact that the modern diet mainly consists of a collection of synthetic chemicals, colours, flavours, and genetically modified organisms. So let's look at some of the things we should be avoiding. Alcohol, coffee, fizzy or carton drinks, meat and fish, sugar, salt, wheat products, dairy products, starchy foods such as potatoes, rice, pasta, etc., anything genetically modified, and all processed foods. That's most people's diets right there. And here's a good tip. The longer the shelf life, the shorter yours. So the best you can possibly do regarding food is to go as high up Hotema's list as you can and have as little food as possible. So that might take the form of one meal a day of mainly fresh, organic, juicy fruits and berries and the occasional light leafy green salad, avoiding dense earthy root vegetables and salad dressings except coconut oil and perhaps lemon juice. So in effect, you're limiting the amount of work the body has to do reacting to and eliminating the food. But you can go one better and adopt a program of fasting into your routine by choosing two days out of the week, say a Monday and a Thursday, and not eating anything at all on those days. And once the body gets used to this routine, then fast for an entire week out of each month. Fasting is a very effective tool for repairing and maintaining the body. And quite simply, it works by freeing up the massive amounts of energy that the body would have used to digest food so that it can be reallocated for repair and maintenance. When you fast, your body immediately makes use of the extra energy to start eliminating toxins from itself. So you will experience what are known as detox symptoms or a healing crisis. The toxins have to leave the body somehow. So you may notice bad breath, greasy hair, weakness, tiredness, aches and pains, or some ailment might seem to flare up. The medical profession will tell you that these symptoms are a problem and a danger sign that you're lacking nutrition or minerals or something. But this is a lie. Before your body can heal, it must eliminate all the toxins that are harming it. If you remember one thing from this presentation, Remember that if you ever get sick, stop eating and rest. Allow your body the energy that it needs to accomplish its healing tasks. And now let's turn our attention to distilled water. Distilled water is quite a controversial subject, as there are many people out there who will warn you that it is dangerous to drink. The word distilled sounds very clinical and daunting, but another word for distilled is pure pure water. So the idea that you shouldn't really be drinking pure water now sounds quite ridiculous. Distilling is not filtering. This chart shows the difference between distilling, filtering and other forms of water treatment. You can see that distilling removes absolutely everything. The next best thing is reverse osmosis filtering. But boiling only removes bacteria and viruses. The problem with filters is that eventually they become breeding grounds for bacteria as they tend to be warm, wet, dark places. Use a filter for a few months and cut it open and you'll find it's pretty slimy in there. In a distiller, water is turned into steam and then condensed back into pure water. All the inorganic minerals, chemicals, cells from dead animals, bacteria, viruses, they remain at the bottom of the distiller. And out the other end you have pure water that contains zero parts per million dissolved solids. Nature only makes distilled water. Rain, snow, mist, fog and dew are all distilled by a similar but natural process. Now, doctors will tell you not to drink distilled water. They will tell you that it leaches minerals out of the body, leaving you with the impression that all the calcium will be sucked out of your bones 
and you're liable to snap like a twig in the lightest of breezes. But what they conveniently forget to tell you is that there are two types of minerals, organic and inorganic. You are made up of organic living minerals. But the minerals in tap water, bottled water, mineral water and spring water are inorganic minerals, essentially particles of rock and dirt that have been picked up along the way. This picture gives you an idea of the difference between organic and inorganic minerals. One is organic iron and the other is rust. Most supplements are the inorganic forms. Just try dropping a cornflake that's been fortified with iron in a bowl of water and then drag it around with a magnet to see what sort of iron it's been fortified with. The body cannot metabolize inorganic minerals, so they are deposited in the organs and tissues. When it collects in and around the joints, it's called arthritis. In our eyes, it's cataracts and glaucoma. In our arteries, that's heart disease, strokes and arteriosclerosis. In our kidneys, kidney stones, in our gallbladder, gallstones and so on and so on. Distilled water dissolves and washes away inorganic minerals, but it doesn't touch the organic forms. We know this intuitively. We use water to wash our clothes. The inorganic minerals, rock and dirt, comes out of our clothes and stays in the water but it doesn't touch organic matter like blood stains, sweat stains and grass stains. But if you were to put dirty water into your washing machine, then the water already contains a large amount of dissolved matter, so it's no longer able to dissolve anymore, and so your clothes end up dirtier than they were before they went in. Tap water, bottled water, spring water and mineral water are all bad for you for this reason alone. Even rainwater, which is obviously naturally distilled, is no longer as good for you as it once was. In the past, the sun would heat up the sea and evaporate water, which would form cloud high up in the atmosphere, where it would interact with the ozone. So not only was the rain clean and pure, but it would also contain a relatively high concentration of hydrogen peroxide, which is actually very beneficial to the body. But these days, there's a lot of pollution in the air so the water vapour tends to coalesce around particles of pollution, much lower in the atmosphere where there is no ozone. You could always wait for the first of the rain to clean the air before collecting it, but you're probably better off with a tabletop distiller like this one here. Nonetheless, there will be those who will insist that in order to make distilled water safe to drink, you will have to put the inorganic minerals like pink Himalayan sea salt back into it. I would suggest that anyone who tells you that pure water is dangerous unless you put a little dirt in it is very cleverly speaking out of a small hole in their bottom. We contaminate our water enough as it is. We make it bitter, acid, sweet and add flavour and chemicals and artificial colours in coffees, teas and soft drinks. But fundamentally our perception of water has been manipulated. Now we're going to show you some water. This is tap water and we're going to kind of like put this on a, on a trial tonight and we're going to prove that this water is absolutely filthy and unable to do the job that water was intended to do. This is distilled water. We're going to prove that it's pure water. It's absolutely pure and it's the water we should put in our body and uh, we'll be able to see the difference between these two waters real quick. One question I have here, does water conduct electricity? You know, if it's tap water, it's absolutely filthy, we know it does. If I touch these two wires together, that light goes on. That's an open circuit. If he's an electrician, he'd call it a, a normally open circuit. If I put it in distilled water, it does exactly what it's supposed to do, and that's nothing because those two wires aren't touching. That's an open circuit. It shouldn't light the light. But if I put it in tap water, it closes that gap. There's something in that water that's making that gap close. And the difference between these two waters is this is absolutely filthy water, this is pure water. Our water comes to a treatment plant where we're chemically treating our water. That's why it's called the treatment plant. Our water is exposed to many chemicals. This is a, a newspaper from, from Utah called Capital Connections. News for about people in state government. 
the Utah State seal. On the back of it, it says, making sure your water's safe. It's written about Eva Neminsky. She has a PhD in environmental engineering. She's over all 50 water treatment plants in the state of Utah. She says right here, we're learning about very resistant pathogens in water. They're very difficult to kill, so you need strong disinfectants. These chemicals may ultimately cause cancer over your lifetime. So the question becomes, would you rather have diarrhea today or cancer tomorrow? So who wants diarrhea and who wants cancer? Pretty, pretty good choice there, huh? That's the two choices we have, drinking tap water. How many cups of water are we supposed to drink today? Eight cups. This is eight cups boiled down. That's what you're drinking into your body every single day, eight cups of water. That's eight cups. That's one day. This is 30 days. This is 365 <coughs> days. And this is 10 years. How old are you? 45. 45. You've run 4.5 of those through your body. Okay? You can find that out, every one of you. That's what your body has to deal with, drinking tap water. That's why when we put the light in tap water, it conducts electricity. There's 80,000 chemicals in our, in our water. In 1903, we had three people and 100 dying with cancer. In that 100 years till now, we've developed 80,000 commercially produced chemicals. And right now, one in four people die with cancer. And one in three people get cancer. And the cancer rate is still rising. And when you think about chemicals in our life, we wash our hair with chemicals, we brush our teeth with chemicals, we wash our clothes with chemicals, we have chemicals on our food. We're a chemical society. The only thing that takes that out of our body is the water we drink. Right here in the laboratory, let's take distilled water through the same journey the tap water's been on and make the light go on it. We'll have to add a lot of things to it. First thing we'll add to it is bacteria and virus and parasites. I'll wash my hands in it. Five parts per million will make this light go on, and we'll see just how dirty my hands are. Pretty clean hands, huh? The tap water is still hundreds of times filthier than the distilled water. But you know the real funny thing about it is, though, you won't drink this water now, will you? No. Why not? Because it has fewer. Yeah, but it's still hundreds of times cleaner the tap water. Did you see what your eyes just did to your brain now? You saw something in your water. What do you really want in your water? Nothing. Me too. That, when I saw this the first time, that's what I decided. I didn't want anything in my water. I wanted clean water. But we can take it a little bit further and, and make the light go on. This is uh, some of the inorganic minerals we get out of our distiller. We'll put some of that in there. We'll put some chemical from farms and factories in there. And we'll stir that around. So that's starting to look like Mount, Mountain Dew, right? That's what you're just thinking. <laughs> now we'll take it to the water treatment plant where we'll add a little bit of technology to it. And we'll stir that around and we'll aerate it a little bit, just like even Minsky's talking about there. Add a little technology to the water. The right amount of chemicals we can make that awful looking water look just like tap water. Isn't that cool? Now let's see if we made it tap water. Yep. Now, according to Ivan Minsky, that's safe water to drink. You all want to drink it now? Why not? It's safe. What's the definition of safe water? Won't cause diarrhea today. <laughs> Let's see what we've done here with the TDS meter. This TDS stands for total dissolved solids. That means anything that's totally dissolved in the water will show up with the TDS meter. Now, Ron, I want you to read this for me and tell me what parts per million that says. Zero. Zero, zero, zero parts per million. Now, tap water right from this Ogden City here. Let's see what that's saying. 296, 308 now. 308. 308 parts per million. Now this water that Teresa wouldn't drink, let's see what that was. After I threw all that, that filth in there. 56, 54, 54, 
floor. It's still, what, six times cleaner than tap water. Can you imagine how much filth is in tap water? If you could see where that tap water's been, where all the carcasses of the animals, the dead insects, the inorganic minerals, the chemicals that's in this water, if you could see what was in that water that's making 296 parts per million, you'd never drink it. You'd never ever drink it. And you should. And now we come to urine therapy. This is a very difficult therapy for most people to get their heads around. It is a process of drinking one's own urine and also washing in it, as well as applying it in various other ways depending on the issue or ailment. Now, there are so many myths and taboos associated with this topic that people have a tendency to switch off at the mere mention of drinking one's own urine. So let's examine these myths. The first one is, urine is a waste product. Well, no. Urine is actually the excess of the beneficial substances in the blood. The liver removes all toxins and pathogens from the blood. The kidneys receive the purified blood and regulates the amount of salts, vitamins, minerals, hormones, enzymes, amino acids and water in order to keep the blood in perfect balance as having too much of something is just as bad as having not enough. And sometimes, while it is sitting in your bladder, your body might realise that it needs some of these life-giving substances and reabsorb it. Many have had the experience of wanting to go to the toilet and then getting distracted, and an hour or so later they realise they no longer need to go. That's because the body has reabsorbed enough of the urine and relieved the pressure on the bladder. Urine is a snapshot of everything the body needs in exactly the right proportions for you. It is also a holographic record of everything that's going on in the body right now. The medical term for urine is plasma ultrafiltrate, that is, ultra-filtered blood plasma. Your urine is literally your lifeblood. Amniotic fluid is also urine. Firstly, the mothers, and then the babies. And it's responsible for forming your lungs and your skin. It is most certainly not waste. Urine is dirty and smelly. Well, no again. Urine is one of the most sterile substances on Earth. The pungent smell only occurs after it sits on an inorganic surface that's exposed to the air. Urine doesn't contain ammonia, but ammonia forms as a byproduct of its antibacterial properties. In fact, urine is actually a natural detergent, and it was what was used in Chinese laundries. The smell of urine is obviously affected by your diet, your current state of health, and even your emotional state, but it actually smells of you. It's usually dark and strong tasting in the beginning particularly in the morning, but after a short period of detox, your urine becomes clear and sparkling, and after the body is completely detoxified, urine sometimes tastes of coconut water. If the body's getting rid of it, why put it back in? Well, as I explained earlier, it isn't getting rid of it because it's waste. It's dumping excess that it can't use at the moment but the situation changes from moment to moment, and once urine is reabsorbed into the system, the body now doesn't have to expend lots of energy manufacturing any of these substances in the urine. So there is an almost immediate energy boost. Urine is antibiotic, analgesic, and an immune system booster. It contains growth hormones, minerals, vitamins, and endorphins which kill pain, lifts moods, and boosts energy. It is also packed with stem cells, which are prototype cells that can become anything, skin, bone, muscle, heart tissue, and literally they roam around looking for things to repair. Even the medical mafia and scientific priesthood are grudgingly accepting the power of stem cells, although they are nevertheless keen to hide where these stem cells come from and keep you dependent on their so-called expertise. Here, they acknowledge that these stem cells can regrow and repair organs, 
but imply that this process requires laboratory conditions and access to amniotic fluid, which, as I mentioned earlier, is urine. Don't be fooled. Your body has the inherent capability to repair itself and regrow damaged organs and even limbs without medical intervention, if you only allow it to do so. Why don't doctors prescribe it then? Well, because medicine is a racket. It's a trillion dollar business. And if everybody knew how to heal themselves using urine therapy, then the medical profession and the pharmaceutical industry would disappear because they would become irrelevant overnight. And their corporate masters would have to find some other way to quietly depopulate the West. Here is a quote from a Dr. Alan Greenberg. As a retired physician, I can honestly say that unless you are in a serious accident, your best chance of living to a ripe old age is to avoid doctors and hospitals and learn about nutrition, herbal medicine and other forms of natural medicine unless you are fortunate enough to have a naturopathic physician available. Almost all drugs are toxic and are designed only to treat symptoms and not to cure anyone. Vaccines are highly dangerous have never been adequately studied or proven to be effective, and have a poor risk-reward ratio. Most surgery is unnecessary, and most textbooks of medicine are inaccurate and deceptive. Almost every disease is said to be idiopathic, without known cause, or genetic, although this is untrue. In short, our mainstream medical system is hopelessly inept and or corrupt. The treatment of cancer and degenerative diseases is a national scandal. The sooner you learn this, the better off you will be. In 1976, doctors went on strike in Los Angeles for one month, and the number of deaths fell by 18%. And during a similar doctor strike in Israel in 1983, the mortality rate dropped by 50%. And you can bet, as soon as they went back to work, the death rate went straight back to normal. What does that tell you? Death by doctor is so common that the term iatrogenic death has been coined for it. And it is either the biggest killer or the second biggest killer in the developed world, depending on whose numbers you use. Doctors will not prescribe urine because it's not sanctioned by the medical associations. And it never will be sanctioned because it works. I couldn't possibly drink my own urine. It's all a matter of perspective. Many people who feel that they couldn't bring themselves to drink their own urine will not hesitate to eat a highly processed non-food that might be delicious, but it should be remembered that your stomach does not have taste buds. And while your mouth has been seduced with flavours designed to be addictive, your stomach has been poisoned with sometimes hundreds of chemical additives. What about a nice glass of milk then? Well, apart from drinking a cow's bodily fluids that are designed for a baby cow, milk also contains pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, and often pus from mastitis infections. Milk also stimulates the body into producing mucus. Adults don't require milk, and humans don't require anything squirted out of a cow. When you think about it, 
the purpose of cow's milk, I did most of my growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, the purpose of cow's milk is to turn a 65 pound calf into a 400 pound cow as rapidly as possible. Cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. That's what this stuff is. <clears throat> Everything in that white liquid, the hormones, the lipids, the proteins, the sodium, the growth factors, the IGF, all, every one of those is meant to blow that calf up to a great big cow. It wouldn't be there. And whether you pour it on your cereal as a liquid, whether you clot it into yogurt, whether you fit it into cheese, whether you freeze it into ice cream, it's baby calf growth fluid. And women eat it and it stimulates their tissues and it gives women breast lumps. It makes the uterus get big and they get fibroids and they bleed and they get hysterectomies and they need mammograms and, and gives guys man boobs. This is cow's milk is the lactation secretions of a large bovine mammal who just had a baby. It's for baby calves. You know, I tell my patient, go look in the mirror. Do you have big ears? Do you have a tail? Are you a baby calf? If you're not, don't be eating baby calf growth fluid in, in any level. There's nothing in it people need. Why not have a Coke instead? Well, immediately after drinking a Coca-Cola, the massive amounts of phosphoric acid prevents the immediate vomiting up of the 10 teaspoons of sugar it contains. 20 minutes later, your blood sugar spikes and the liver creates fat to deal with the sugar. 40 minutes later, the caffeine causes pupil dilation, high blood pressure, and the liver dumps more sugar into the bloodstream. After 45 minutes, the body creates a dopamine high, just like heroin. After an hour, the high level of phosphoric acid causes the body to draw in calcium, sodium, magnesium, zinc, electrolytes, and water to combat the acidity. The caffeine causes it all to be urinated out. So, after an hour or so, the sugar crash hits, leaving you weak, irritable, dehydrated, and lacking in minerals. So, what about eating meat? If you still think that eating meat is natural, then don't go to a supermarket and pick up a cellophane-wrapped slab of meat. Go out to the woods and catch your prey with your own hands, and eat all of it, without cooking, seasoning, or sauces and you'll soon realise that you're eating dead animal flesh, which ends up in a long intestinal tract not designed to have rotting meat in it. Drinking your own urine is a million times better for you than any of these bizarre practices. I could never put wee on my skin. Well, if you've ever used a moisturiser, then chances are you already have. Urine is literally the only moisturiser, and in almost all lotions, moisturisers, hand and face creams, if you look at the list of ingredients, you're likely to find urea or uric acid or ure something to disguise the fact that you're using cow, pig or horse urine. But of course, your own is better for you. It is also well known that supermodels use urine on their faces to remain young looking. And as I mentioned earlier, you've already done urine therapy and had it on your skin when you were a baby swimming in the amniotic fluid. So, how do you perform urine therapy? In a clean glass, capture the first urination of the morning. The first one in the morning is important because while you slept, your body used all the energy you saved by resting to produce everything that it needed. So the morning urine will be the most nutritionally dense, for want of a better phrase. You capture it midstream, that is you miss the first few teaspoons and last few. Drink almost all of the captured urine within 15 minutes, keeping some aside for other uses. You can mix it with fruit juice or distilled water, or you can take a deep breath, hold it while you drink it all down in one go, and while you're still holding your breath, you drink a mouthful or two of distilled water or fruit juice and then breathe out. Or you can just drink it down neat and stop being a pussy. So you use some of the saved urine to wash with. How you wash with it is that you pour a little in the palm of your hand 
and then you massage it into the skin a section at a time until it absorbs. It's not like water. With water, you push it around the skin and eventually you'll have to towel it off. But your urine will be absorbed and will be dry within minutes and it won't smell. You can also use it in an eye wash cup to soothe sore, tired or irritated eyes. And people have been known to throw away their glasses after using it in this way for some period of time. You can also put drops in your ears for earache and hearing problems. You can also gargle with it to soothe a sore throat. Or you can even snort it through your nostrils for colds or sinus problems. You drink again in the late afternoon or early evening. Not too late because you'll notice that you get an energy boost within a few minutes of drinking it. And if you take it too late in the evening and you're not used to it, then it will keep you up all night. Save any excess urine that you're not intending to drink in a dark glass bottle stopped with a wad of cotton wool so that it can breathe and you store it in a cool dark place. Now, this is known as aged urine and it's for external uses only and the older it gets the better. Drinking twice a day I would suggest is a good starting point but you can actually drink as much as you like without any negative effects. In fact, the process that we call looping is drinking all the urine you produce, which acts very powerfully to cleanse the body. Similarly, a urine fast, which is a period where one eats no food and drinks only urine and distilled water, this combines the benefits of urine with the extra energy liberated by fasting. Urine can also be used internally in several other ways. It can be used homeopathically. Such as if you get an allergic reaction, you wait 10 seconds after the first symptoms appear, collect some of the urine and place 10 drops under your tongue and hold it there for as long as possible. The symptoms should disappear within 10 minutes and if not, you just repeat hourly until it does. You can also prepare a homeopathic solution by putting one drop of urine in 5 milliliters of distilled water. You shake it or succuss it 50 times. And then you take one drop of that solution and put it in another 5 milliliters of distilled water, shake 50 times, and you put one drop of that in 5 milliliters of high proof vodka as a preservative, and voila, you have a homeopathic solution. Externally, urine can be used as a foot bath. A good deal of toxins are eliminated through the feet, so urine foot baths can sometimes dramatically aid the cleansing process. Another very powerful external use is known as a urine pack and it is very useful for healing many things including cuts from little nicks and paper cuts to deep lacerations which we might imagine would need stitches. They will heal within three days without scars or scar tissue. Burns, all the way to serious third degree burns, a urine pack will heal such a burn in three days and again won't leave a scar. Aches, pains and inflammation, well, aches and pains will usually disappear immediately and inflammation goes down within minutes. Sores and rashes begin to heal almost immediately and splinters that are normally inaccessible are ejected by the body with the help of a urine pack within a couple of days. Snake, animal and insect bites and stings are also relieved instantly and any ensuing allergic reaction can be avoided by combining the urine pack with the 10 drops under the tongue method. So to use a urine pack, you simply soak a dressing, cotton wool pad or even a clean rag in urine, place it on the site of the injury and wrap it in place using cling film to prevent leaks. You keep it on there as long as possible and keep it moist with additional applications of urine. Simple as that. The final aspect of this holistic body-centric approach is understanding and utilizing the connection between the mind and body. The mind has complete control over every aspect of the body. Right now, whether you know it or not, part of your mind is controlling the beating of your heart, the growing of your hair, the operation of your thyroid gland. You just don't know how you're doing it. In fact, there are a lot of things that we just don't know how we do. How do you move your hand to catch a ball? You just think about it and it happens. 
but sometimes you don't even have to think about it. 99% of what we do occurs at the level below the conscious. Every so-called disease begins as a thought pattern. Every type of thought pattern causes a cascade of a particular mix of chemicals, hormones, enzymes and other substances. But we experience this chemical release as an emotion. So the chemicals that are coursing through your body when you're scared are very different from those that are released when you feel happiness. This chemical release is an emergency response to the thought pattern in order to prepare your body for the consequences of that thought pattern. If you're crossing the road and halfway across you drop some of the items you're carrying and as you pick them up you notice the lights change. And even though you don't know if a car is coming, your mind will interpret the changing signal and your current predicament and the thought pattern will be that you are in immediate danger. The chemicals will be released that will prepare your body to escape the danger. The blood will be drawn from your core and distributed to your limbs. Your energy-hungry immune system is shut down and the energy is redirected to your muscles. Your higher brain function is shut down so that you will act more quickly on instinct. But this is an emergency response and the imbalances and chemicals are only meant to be experienced for short periods. We feel the emotion, deal with the situation and the chemicals subside and the body returns to normal. But in our culture, we have mental programming that puts us in chronic and deep-seated emotional states. And this is the trigger for most so-called disease. One of the best examples of the body-mind connection is the placebo effect. Most people have heard of this. If you believe that a sugar pill will heal you, then it will heal you. But what most people don't know is that the effect is even more powerful if the doctor administering the placebo is also convinced that the sugar pill is effective. So there's a measurable third party effect. Also the reverse is true. It's called the nocebo effect. If a doctor tells you that you're going to die in three months and you believe him, then you'd better get your affairs in order because your body will find a way to make it happen. This is why the number of deaths from smoking related diseases rose sharply after warnings started appearing on cigarette packets. Doctors always seem to want to use the nocebo effect. They almost always give you bad news, and when they do, they make sure that they describe these abstract processes so that you can visualize them and make them real. Or they will use the third party effect I described earlier and call in your family and friends and explain and convince them that you're about to die and use them to heighten the nocebo effect on you. Another example are people who are suffering with multiple personality disorder. The alternate personality will have a different name, age, gender, memories, abilities, artistic talents, foreign language fluency, handwriting and even IQ. But the incredible thing is that sometimes an alternate will have a different eye colour, voice patterns, allergic reactions, menstrual cycle, eyesight, left and right handedness and even colour blindness. Injuries, scars, burns, cysts, epilepsies and even tumours will instantly appear and disappear depending on which personality is in control. This is proof positive that our minds have complete control over every aspect of our bodies. But most of that control is subconscious and our subconscious is overwhelmingly programmed to be negative. The things we say to ourselves, the words we use, are programming us. If you just listen to your self-talk, you'll begin to see how you're setting yourself up for injury and disease. So, to summarise, the body-centric approach is about letting your body do what it is designed to do and staying out of its way. It is about the use of distilled waters to detoxify the body of accumulated toxins, changing the diet away from poisonous foodstuffs, reducing their quantity and density to reduce the stress on the body. Fasting to liberate the energy for healing and to accelerate the detox process and reprogramming the mind to prevent interference with the healing process and to prevent re-triggering.
In part two, we'll examine how to apply body-centric principles to cancer and aging. But now I'd like to show some of the amazing transformations of those who have applied these techniques. So if you want to find out more about how to improve your health and change your life by changing the way you think about how your body works, I have a book out called the Human Body Owner's Workshop Manual, in which I go into more detail about this approach and show how to operate your body, your life and the world around you. Or if you or anyone you know needs some help with healing, I can be contacted at dave at allegedlydave.com or you can go to my website www.allegedlydave.com